Okay, hello, good evening and welcome to Calculating the Cure, Artificial Intelligence and COVID-19, a webinar hosted by the World Innovation Summit for Health, WISH, the Global Health Initiative of Qatar Foundation. My name is Maha al and I am the Head of Content and Research Fellow at WISH, and I'll be your moderator for this session. It's well known that there is a large disconnect between scientists and practitioners and the need to develop effective strategies to better disseminate evidence-based healthcare in a way that is digestible to policymakers and governments is at an all-time high. If scientists want to have a true impact on clinical practice, they must successfully simplify their outcomes and recommendations in order to bridge the gap between research and policy translation. This is one of WISH's core values and goals. And it is, it is our aim to do, to do the same for this session and to be as inclusive and interactive as possible. Therefore, if you have any questions, please post these on social media and tag us at Wish Qatar. I'm joined today by four panelists who will each bring a unique expert perspective on the topic being highlighted today. First off, we have Professor Aziz Sheikh. Professor Sheikh is a director of the Escher Institute. He is also director of the Asthma UK Center for Applied Research. Director of the Scottish Allergy and Respiratory Academy, Director of the NIHR Global Respiratory Health Unit, and is co-director of the NHS Digital Academy. Currently, Aziz holds a number of visiting chairs, namely University of Birmingham, Queen Mary's University of London, and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. He was previously visiting professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is an editorial board member of BMC Medicine Health Informatics Journal Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, Medical Care and PLOS Medicine. Aziz was a forum chair in data science and artificial intelligence at WISH 2018. Also joining us tonight is Dr. Raghavendra Mal. Dr. Raghavendra is a research scientist at the Qatar Computing Research Institute. He works on developing and utilizing data-driven modeling techniques for computational biology with a primary focus on network biology and structural informatics, bioinformatics. In network biology, he is primary, primarily interested in problems like differential network analysis, gene regulatory network inference, master regulatory uh, analysis, and disease module identification in bio biological networks. From a structural bioinformatics point of view, he is particularly interested in designing sequence-based approaches for protein solubility, protein crystallization, and ultimately protein function prediction. He is also intent on predicting viral protein neutralization, antibody function, and design accurate in silicon in silico drug sensitivity predictors at a pan cancer level. Dr. Prasanna Kolaktar also joins us from Qatar Biomedical Research Institute. Dr. Prasanna graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 1991, where he studied structural biology at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. He then spent several years studying structural biology in the laboratory of Michael Rossman at Purdue University, where he studied virus receptor relationships and received a Jane Coffin Childs Memorial Fund Fellowship. Upon moving to Singapore in 1997, he worked for the Bioinformatics Center and Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology and joined the Genome Institute of Singapore in the year 2001. His current work involves understanding the molecular details of transcription factor complexes involved in stem cell biology. His laboratory uses biochemistry as well as structural biology to discover how transcription factors create function through com combinatorial interactions. Recently, this work has led to the re-engineering of stem cell function through directed mutagenesis of key residues involved in protein-protein interactions. And last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Bernardo Mariano, who is the director of the Department of Digital Health and Innovation and the chief information officer at the World Health Organization. He is responsible for setting and maintaining the vision and direction of WHO's strategy of health in the digital age. As CIO, he ensures that the digital transformation of WHO enhances the organization's collective performance and efficiency to deliver the health for all global development agenda. Prior to joining the WHO, Mariano held senior man managerial positions in the in International Organization for Migration as Senior Regional Advisor for Sub-Saharan Africa in the Office of the Director General, Chief Information Officer, Information and Communications Technology, and Regional Director for East and Southern Africa. Welcome, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all here this evening. My first question, without further ado, is for Professor Aziz Sheikh. 
Professor Sheikh, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence and data science are terms that have been tossed around very frequently recently. We hear about AI being all around us um, and being inside everything. We even fear that it might one day take over our jobs. But how well do we actually understand what it is and what it's being used for? Perhaps you can help clarify by giving us some basic definitions for data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and their connection and relevance to public health and clinical practice. Um, thanks very much, Maha. It's uh, great to join this very distinguished panel. Um, so very pleased to be here. Um, so your questions um, in are really, I think, important foundational questions that I hope colleagues will be able to build on uh, as we proceed um, during the course of this webinar. Um, so a number of these issues we tackled in the, in the report that we produced for WISH um, a couple of years ago on harnessing the power of data science and artificial intelligence uh, for healthcare. That report is freely available on the web, so colleagues may want to refer to that for more details. Uh, but briefly, um, data science um, is really a very interdisciplinary field. And if we think about the data life cycle, so there's data um, creation, uh, data um, being brought together, so uh, data integration, there's data processing, uh, curation, analysis, and then the process of deriving insights from data. So data science I mean, covers I mean, that whole uh, life uh, cycle of data uh, and the mechanisms, the processes, the systems that we use uh, to, to draw on data and, and derive uh, some meaningful insights uh, from that. Um, the whole field then of artificial intelligence is a subset uh, um, of, of data science. Um, and artificial intelligence has been with us for many decades, but I think really has come to the fore over the last few years for a number of reasons that I, mean, I can go into if, if, if time allows. But what we're interested in here are computers um, really taking on uh, human functions, so the process of cognition, being able to interact with data, um, um, typically by themselves without any human input, uh, and derive some meaning from that, and then, um, then interacting with the human world. Um, so really a subset, uh, and artificial intelligence um, I mean, again, can be defined in, in a number of ways, but really there tends to be sort of four key components that we um, uh, talk about here when we're talking about the artificial intelligence. So the kinds of interactions we're talking about are uh, issues to do with uh, the ability to uh, process uh, written or spoken uh, language, so natural language uh, processing ability, um, the ability to see um, the, the world around us, so uh, computerized vision, um, the ability then uh, to... Um, actually interact with large volumes of data uh, and derive meaning. Uh, so we're talking there about machine learning based uh, uh, approaches. Um, and then um, uh, robotics, and typically robotics will be integrating many of those um, in other three dimensions as well. Um, so they're the kind of four main headings that we talk about in, the, in that WISH report. Um, but I mean, maybe just to emphasize, these are not standalone. Uh, increasingly, they're being integrated in, in various applications. Um, so, Maha, I mean, then you talk about uh, well, what, what are the kind of applications uh, to, to public health healthcare? Well, I think I mean, we're still at a pretty early stage uh, uh, of, of this journey, um, but I think already we're beginning to see I mean, a number of ways in which um, uh, I mean, the, the whole field of artificial intelligence is beginning to uh, uh, interact, really, with uh, healthcare, public health, uh, healthcare provision. Uh, so, for example, I mean, it's being used to uh, look at, um, quite extensively being used in, in the field of diagnosis, uh, uh, risk stratification-based approaches, uh, trying to identify uh, potential curative treatments, I mean, uh, uh, helping out, helping tease out, I mean, from the, the array of options that are available, which ones are most likely to get traction. Um, also being used to guide decision-making, uh, uh, that's decision making by uh, clinicians, but also increasingly uh, by patients as well. Um, so, I mean, a, a, I mean, a whole array of uh, uses already, but I think we're still at very early stages of this journey. Thank you, Professor Sheikh. Now that we have um, a, a better understanding about what artificial intelligence are or is, uh, can you please help us uh, by explaining to us a little bit how it's been used uh, specifically in the COVID-19 response from a population health perspective? Yeah, so um, thanks, Maha. And um, it's probably best if I just share some 
examples of, of what we're doing uh, in, in, in my research group. So one of the things that I've been very fortunate to be able to do is create a, a national uh, data platform for Scotland, which is an end-to-end -end platform. So we, we link up primary care data with um, uh, emergency department data, testing data, hospitalizations, intensive care, mortality data. And we've been able to do that for the entire Scottish population. So we, I, mean, I think we've got a, a pretty unique uh, platform there. What we're then able to do is to begin to look at uh, um, the, the, the pandemic and how it's evolving, and then to be able to predict what, what's likely to happen in the future. So that's one way in which we're beginning to use uh, um, machine learning-based approaches, uh, for example, to study and predict uh, the likely changing shape of the pandemic. We've been able to also been able to look uh, to assess what the likely impact of non-pharmacological interventions that are being implemented across the world. So by that, I mean things like um, lockdown measures, for example, or uh, face coverings, et cetera. So we can begin to uh, I mean, estimate what the likely impact is uh, uh, to be at a population level um, in across an entire nation. A second approach that we've been using, uh, and this work is, uh, um, I mean, some of this has recently been published, other studies are about to be uh, published, uh, is this whole field of risk stratification. Um, so, I mean, as we know that um, the majority of people who develop uh, get infected with SARS-CoV-2 uh, are asymptomatic. Uh, a subset of those will develop uh, uh, symptoms, and, uh, and a smaller subset still will develop uh, the severe life-threatening uh, complications manifesting as hospitalization, intensive care admission, requirement for ventilation, and uh, unfortunately, um, some are dying as a result of that process. So how can we um, begin to better identify uh, those who are um, most likely to experience those severe outcomes um, so we are now uh, using machine learning based approaches uh, in our uh, risk prediction models and um, seeing whether they're adding value over and above the traditional approaches that we're using. And this is really, I mean, I think quite important, uh, not only for, I mean, if we have to ration treatment uh, options, uh, um, then we can use this approach to try and decide well, where best to target our resources. Um, but I think this is also going to become very important as, uh, I mean, hopefully a vaccine becomes available and we begin to decide, try and decide uh, how to prioritize its rollout. I mean, we're talking about I mean, a vaccination of potentially sort of 4 billion people plus, I mean, across the planet. Nothing like this has ever been done before. Um, there's going to be um, capacity issues. Uh, and so we're going to need to prioritize. And this kind of an approach might be quite helpful in terms of helping us prioritize those who are most at risk of severe outcomes. And the third example, and this is I mean, slightly atypical, uh, but this is work that we've been doing in conjunction with the Scottish Government uh, as it um, sort of rolls out its, its approach to managing the pandemic uh, is we've been using natural language processing, so another sort of branch of artificial intelligence, uh, to study public sentiment. So we're analysing Twitter and Facebook posts uh, to study public responses, I mean, how um, uh, the, the policy is being received, um, misapprehensions that there may be around this, so, for example, we're currently doing this around, I mean, uh, issues to do with, um, I mean, some of the racial or ethnic disparities that we're seeing in COVID-19 outcomes uh, across the UK. We're also using it to inform uh, or, or highlight, I mean, potential issues that there may be with, with vaccine rollout. Um, maybe, Mahadha, just the last uh, example, um, and this is one where, sort of, at the moment, this is more conceptual, but we're very interested in the capacity of robots and uh, increasing their their use in this context and two particular applications I mean I, I'm interested in discussion with colleagues in our national robotarium so one is how can we use um, robotics to increase our testing capabilities so the taking of swabs and samples I mean we already know I mean, these are being used quite extensively at the back end in laboratories but I think I mean at the front end as well there's quite a lot of mileage and and then the, 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 I mean another example of this is that I mean, in our healthcare facilities, educational facilities, care home facilities, as a result of the pandemic, we are needing to, I mean, employ cleaning much more extensively, much more regularly than previously was the case. And at the moment, this is a very human task, but there may be the potential to actually deploy ro robots uh, in, in this respect. So a few of the examples that we in our, my group have been used, uh, thinking about using, I mean, developments in this field uh, it, it, to help respond to the COVID-19 pandemic.
Thank you, Dr. Sheikh. Um, if you have any published work, we would love uh, for you to share that uh, at WISH and for our wider community as well. I'm sure they'd be very interested. Um, my last question to you for this round at least is that there has been very heavy media coverage on COVID-19, this being the only pandemic to have coincided with the age of social media. Undoubtedly, this puts scientists at a serious, unusual scrutiny and pressure to come up with an effective solution and fast. And has this extra added pressure to get results been particularly helpful or unhelpful? Well, I think it's, as ever, my height, it's probably a, a bit of both. Um, so, um, I mean, I think the ways in which it's been helpful um, are there's been unprecedented uh, global collaboration. Uh, the fact that we've got this event taking place with colleagues in uh, across the world re reaching out to in an audience that's global, I mean, there's an example of that. So I think there's been um, sort of um, phenomenal uh, sharing of um, tools, resources, um, data, um, and I think that, that that's a kind of a step in the right direction. I mean, I, I firmly believe in uh, open science-based models, highly collaborative uh, approaches. I think that that approach has been um, been accelerated in this context. I think another thing that's been incredibly helpful from my perspective is that um, the discussion with um, colleagues in policy-making circles um, has been really catalyzed. So, for example, a number of the leading academics, uh, uh, for example, in the UK, and I'm sure that's elsewhere, are, are now regularly meeting with uh, colleagues in policy-making circles, government, uh, uh, civil service, and I think that that's healthy because that, that aids the translation because we're, we're grappling with something that's been incredibly complex. I think for me, the thing that's been challenging, um, and I still am not really decided where I am on this, is um, science moves forward through a process of um, academic peer review, uh, um, I mean, considerable scrutiny by, um, by by our colleagues. And I think that's an incredibly healthy process. Um, I think what's sort of slightly been turned on its head is that uh, um, sometimes this process is now being bypassed with scientists reporting directly to the media um, or through social media. And I think the issue of preprints has also sort of contributed to that. And I think that there is sort of merit in all of this, but I think we need to be clear that when when this is happening, uh, this is not the equivalent of uh, uh, sort of peer review contributions to literature. I mean, I can see why why this is happening uh, and can perfectly understand it. I mean, there, there is a, obviously this wish for very rapid results, uh, but it does leave me feeling uh, slightly uneasy and I'm not entirely sure how I, mean, I should be responding in that respect at the moment. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Aziz. Uh, we're going to move on to our next panelist, Dr. Raghvendra Mal. Uh, Dr. Raghvendra, we all know it takes around a decade and millions or even billions of dollars to develop a new pharmaceutical drug from the initial idea to when it actually hits the market. Clinical trials alone take give or take around seven years. Alternatively, we have around 20,000 prescription drugs that are already on the market and that have been vigorously studied and tested for their safety, efficacy, and toxicity. Therefore, during emergency situations such as this one, the idea of drug repurposing has become increasingly attractive. Drug repurposing, in simple terms, is taking a drug that already exists and identifying new illnesses that it could potentially treat. So Dr. Raghvendra, firstly, can you explain to us how AI and data science can help scientists repurpose drugs for the treatment of COVID-19? And can you tell us specifically about the work that you've been doing here in Qatar on drug repurposing for this particular coronavirus? Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. And I would reflect a lot on what uh, Dr. Aziz said, like uh, coming from a background of uh, AI and machine learning. So uh, the first thing I would say is like, it is very important to note that, you know, AI and data science techniques are always data hungry. Uh, they become more and more effective when you have large quantities of data that is available. And given that we live in the information age, uh, this huge amount of data, which is uh, publicly uh, becoming publicly available very fast. To be a little bit more specific, uh, we have government organizations such as the National Institute of Health from the US, the European Bioinformatics Institute, which basically is making open access, uh, comprehensive online databases about drugs 
and their targets. So using these kind of resources, what we are trying to do in our framework, our AI based uh, repurposing framework is to have a simplistic representation of a drug and take the easiest possible uh, representation that you can get for the virus, which is in the form of viral proteins. And we then collect information uh, about drugs which have been affected against some viruses from these open resources and pass it to a plethora of AI based models. By doing that, now the AI based model look for patterns and they can identify whether a given drug would be effective in blocking the effect of a, a given virus. So we take a consensus of these uh, uh, plethora of AI based models or as Dr. Aziz said, specifically the machine learning based models, uh, we take a consensus of them and identify a rank list of FDA approved drugs, which can potentially uh, block the coronavirus. Uh, I mean, make it ineffective in our body, potentially. So the potentially word is very important here. Uh, so why uh, one of the interesting insights that we get out of our uh, analysis that we did is that we identify in our rank list, like in the top 20 drugs, there were several antivirals, anti-cancer drugs, uh, antibiotics, uh, some antifungal as well as anti-malarial drugs. And some of them included uh, things like remdesivir, favirapivir, uh, mitoxitrone, and bortezom. These, some of these drugs are already uh, in clinical trials. So they kind of provide some kind of a validation of the AI-based models that we are building. But it's important to understand why uh, AI based models that you are uh, to identify uh, repurposable drugs is necessary. It's because like if consider the scenario when you have these 20,000 FDA approved drugs and now I want to test each of these FDA approved drugs in a clinical setting for all the patients, uh, I mean for a set of patients, it would cost you billions of dollars and tens of thousands of man hours. So it's almost unrealistic to do that. And what these AI-based models can help you is basically in doing something like screening. It just helps you to prioritize among these 20,000 drugs, which are the drugs which are potentially going to be the most suitable to block the coronavirus. And that's what we are also trying to do. So I guess this kind of answers the first part of your question. Can you perhaps share with us some highlights or um, some findings, early findings from the study? Yeah, exactly. So as I said, like we identify in our list, like the, we identified several drugs which are already undergoing clinical trials. And then we also, uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. PK, we also try to do uh, further computational studies like through docking. There are techniques by which you can see like whether the drug can bind to the virus. So we use these techniques, but Ultimately, we are just doing the initial stages, uh, in the initial stages, because further, yeah, I mean, in order to see whether the drug can really be effective against the virus, you have to do many other stages. You have to test it in a laboratory environment, and then you have to test it in real patients. So the goal here is just to identify or screen out what can be the set of drugs which we should try out first which are most likely to be effective. And that's where AI can help you by using these different machine learning models and the, taking a consensus of them, we can do that. Thank you, Dr. Agbendra. The process is undoubtedly quite complex and in order to achieve the best, most accurate results, it seems quite obvious that you would require the help or support of diver, different global organizations and entities. How could a large organization such as the WHO better support your quest? Yes, so that's actually um, very essential, like large organizations such as the WHO or go and working coordination with government bodies can really help us because the AI based models that we are building right now, they are at their nascent stages. We are just in our beginnings, you know, with we can have more accurate models. So what kind of information if we have additional information patient data uh, or in the form of multi viewpoint information about these patients like their genomic data for example that can help our ai based models to 
find better treatments and not just that it can also allow us to identify drugs which are like already approved which can be personalized you can have tailored treatments for different set of people so this is because you can see like already with the coronavirus we are already aware that different sets of people are showing different types of symptoms so some people have majority of the people show uh, problems associated with uh, lung like pneumonia and all but there are other people who also show neurological problems so i mean you can have tailored treatments if you have more information about uh, such patient and large organizations such as the who in collaboration with uh, uh, government organizations they can uh, provide us such data that we can use ultimately to have better models thank you dr rigbendra we'll be circling back to our representative from the who shortly for a response and i look forward to hearing that but before we move on my last question for to you for this round is how effective has artificial intelligence been for drug repurposing for other medical conditions and what is the success rates can you give us some examples of success stories here yeah so the first thing that i would say here is that it is very important to uh it is imperative to highlight that why drug repurposing why are we doing drug repurposing or drug repositioning it's because uh it has been shown that the costs and the time associated with uh, uh bringing an approved drug to market uh, is almost half of that what you have to do for a novel compound moreover the success rate uh, or the approval rate of uh, approved drugs is significantly higher than that of a novel compound when you are talking in terms of phase 3 clinical trials or bringing them to the market so traditionally most of the drug repurposing uh, 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 stories have been rather serendipitous for example we have the example of uh, sildenafil a drug which was originally meant for heart disease but found its usage in Uh, preventing erectile dysfunction in men so it's one of the most famous uh, uh, stories which is there to give you a concrete example of an ai based uh, uh, success story recently benevolent ai identified bacitinib a drug which basically is used for rheumatoid arthritis and they identified it using an ai based framework to be potentially useful against the covid-19 so now they are actually uh, undergoing clinical trials with bacitinib but to be more specific i mean there has been many success stories of drug repurposing particularly in the field of oncology or cancer so 80% uh, according to a report 80% of the oncologists have at some point or another given a patient suffering from one type of cancer given them an approved drug for one type of cancer to another patient who doesn't have that cancer but i mean who has another type of cancer so they have tried this repositioning uh, many a times like 80% of the oncologists have done this so the point what i'm trying to make here is that i mean an, 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 another example is that of metformin metformin is a, a drug which has been um, shown to be uh, useful uh, for diabetes management but now it has shown indications Uh, in oncology such that there are over 100 clinical trials going on uh, and which are there in phase 2 and phase 3 uh, for metformin for different forms of cancer so the point that i'm trying to make here is that ai based uh, drug repurposing is still relatively new but overcoming the notion that one drug one target one disease there is a plethora of researchers as well as uh, biotechnological companies which are trying to integrate multiple layers of information and pass them to machine learning and deep learning based models such that they can identify drugs which can be repurposed for other diseases to give you some examples there are these companies such as in silico medicine biovista cyclica who are trying to reuse ai based techniques to repurpose drugs for neurodegenerative diseases as well as in the field of oncology so what i would like to conclude with is that with the availability of large amount of information uh, be it patient information be it uh, clinical trial information in the form of text 
different form of information these kind of information can be processed by machine learning based models and then they need to be validated so you need to have valid uh, machine learning models and these can in the near future act as a decision support system uh, which can help policy makers uh, healthcare providers and in the end like the society as a whole so that's what i feel like the future is bright for ai based drug repurposing Thank you very much, Dr. Rakhbendra. Um, we move on now from big data and data science to biology and biochemistry um, with Dr. Prasanna Kol Kolakatar. Um, please correct me if I'm uh, totally bashing <laughs> the pronunciation. Um, Dr. Prasanna, as a biologist I'm working... Sorry? I'm just Dr. PK. Okay, Dr. PK then. <laughs> as a biologist working at QBRI, a lot of your research focuses on protein-protein and protein-DNA interactions. Can you then please explain to us, in simple terms, how the study of protein-protein interactions and protein-DNA interactions is central to drug discovery and precision medicine? Um, sure. And so really, I mean, it, in this day and age, everybody really focuses on genomics and genetics. And there's a very good reason for it, okay? Because it's a very scalable science you can do you know billions and billions of base pairs in a matter of a day and you could have done just a few base pairs let's say just like you know a decade or two decades ago protein science has not quite caught up with that but that doesn't mean it's any less important now when you look at dna genomics what is that it's nothing more than storage it is a blueprint for everything else that's, that's going to make you but what we look like what is our skin color? How big we are? What is our eye color? That's not DNA. That's specific proteins. Why is our blood red? There's a specific protein everybody has heard of, I'm sure. It's called hemoglobin, and it carries and transports oxygen, okay? And so proteins are really the active players, okay? These are the things that are the engines that are inside our cell. So our cells, they contain many things, but let's make it simple. It's like a large balloon, and inside it, it has DNA, which is nothing more than just storage or disk storage. It could be an MP3 file, but then you need the protein, which are like the MP3 player or some engine that then can work with the DNA and then can make important pieces. And so, for example, if you want to talk about COVID, uh, COVID, like all viruses, it's amazingly simple. It's got like 29 total proteins, right? It's very simple. And the amount of DNA is uh, you know, just a you know, drop in the hole compared to something like the human or anything. It's a very small DNA. But yet, with just this small repertoire, it can do so much damage. How is that possible? Even in humans, we have relatively a low number of DNA and proteins, considering how complex we are. How do they make so many amazing, diverse functionality? And we tend to use the same proteins again and again for different purposes. How do we do that? So one protein will come in contact with another protein and make one type of reaction. But that same, pro and for example, I work in developmental biology. I have the same protein, which is going to be responsible for making a stem cell in the beginning. It goes away for a while during the later stages. It comes back and interacts with another protein now, and it's now responsible for neuronal development. So this protein-protein interaction gives a large amount of diversity that is not found you know, just in DNA. But obviously, proteins work with DNA also. So it's like a fake DNA that gets incorporated during viral replication. And so you don't have as good a viral replication, for example. And so um, that's the main thing that protein-protein, protein-DNA interaction uh, studies allows you. It allows you to go at the atomic level to understand how these diverse in, you know, developments, such as how we grow to how a virus enters a cell, can be studied at the very atomic level. Thank you, Dr. PK, for your explanation. Um, and thank you for simplifying it. That's definitely helped me um, better understand the process. And I'm sure it's been very useful for the audience too. Um, my next question follows on from Dr. Rick Vendra's talk. 
Um, and Dr. Rickbender touched on this slightly, but I'd like to hear um, from you about how data science is used to narrow down already existing drugs that can potentially be repurposed to fight other or new diseases. Once the work of the data scientists, scientists is done and the list of potential drugs has been identified, um, we then need to go back into the lab, correct? Uh, what happens next? Can you explain the process to us? Sure, I can. And I'll you know, spend most of the time on what I do, but it's a, a large variety of things. I mean, data science is very good, but biological data science is just pretty good. And I'll tell you a, a, a good story. I had a good friend about 10 years ago. He was a bioinformatics guy. I was a biochemist. And, and he said, you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to do diapers and uh, beer at Google. And what did he mean by that? Because things like that, or if you're going to vote for Trump or against Trump, these are highly deterministic. People like Google can figure these out really rapidly, OK? And these are billion-dollar companies, trillion-dollar companies. So even with that sort of power, it's hard for them to be able to come up with a brand new drug overnight. You know, why is it that we can, you know, do, you know, airline connections and we can find, you know, connections in politics, but is it, why is it so hard in biology, in the drug industry? And the answer is simple, because as I said, there's almost 20 to 30,000 different proteins minimally, but because of, you know, different complications we don't have to get to, maybe it's more like 60 to 80,000 proteins. And they interact in completely different ways with each other. So that combinatorial is just massive, okay? And even with the best predictions right now, we are not 100% or even 70% deterministic. But having said that, it's clearly helpful, okay? And it's changed the way that science works. People like me would be ignorant not to make, you know, take advantage of people like Dr. Raghvendra and the other panelists, because it lets us point ourselves in the right direction, okay? So he he was talking about looking at various potential protein drugs interactions that he has predicted. What do we do? And thanks partly due to a uh, generous grant from WISH, we are now able to um, carry this work out at the biological level. Because for example, we are now starting to produce some of these COVID proteins and some of these drugs we bought now that uh, Dr. Raghwender identified. In the laboratory, we can actually put them in essentially, it's a very simple thermometer. It's, it's called isothermal calorimetry, but it's simple. It's just like a really fancy thermometer. All you do is you have a, let's say a virus protein, you put the drug in. If it makes an interaction, there's a change in the uh, temperature. It's an expensive thermometer because it measures very small changes in temperature, but that immediately tells you how well or how badly something is binding. And by doing this then, we have absolute proof of the fact that Raghvendra's predictions were absolutely real. I don't want to belittle the other parts of this validation, even though I don't do this. You can also have something called cellular validation, where you're looking at to seeing if you have the virus in a cell, if you were then to put the specific compound, are you able to kill the virus, okay, specifically, okay? But for that, you need another type of laboratory. And obviously, a lot of people in the audience are going to say this, and it's true. If it's a repurposed drugs, do you really need to do what I've been talking about? Because it's already been proven safe. It's already going to show that you don't have to worry about these non-off-target you know, off target effects. So it's, it's going to pass that. However, by understanding it at the molecular level, you have a really good idea about exactly what is binding and what are the possibilities of non-topic you know, or off-topic off effects. And using things like three-dimensional structure, you can even modify these in the future and make even better drugs. So that's where we fit in and how we fit in perfectly with Dr. Ragmander's work. So I understand that um, someone like Dr. Ragmander is absolutely crucial to your work. Um, just how important is cross-discipline collaboration to your work? I would say it's not only important to my work, but really it's important for everybody's work. And for me, I was belittling DNA just 10 minutes ago, and I said, it's just nothing but storage piece. But everything starts with genomics. Because of the power and the scalability, you can find out all small differences at the DNA level immediately, okay? Protein proteomics, it's still coming along. It's a very important science, but it's being, being developed, and it doesn't have the scalability of doing you know, 6 billion base pairs overnight. Okay, we just don't have that yet. So genomics immediately gives us some information or some clue, and that's part of the DNA part, okay? 
But then as a, inf uh, as a person who works in biochemistry, I'm looking at the very smallest level, which is protein and DNA, protein and ligands. A very good friend of mine, he was my ex-director in Genome Institute, uh, Edison Liu, he once said to me, that's really interesting what you're doing in a test tube, but nobody cares about a test tube. And he was right. And so I always work for, with people after the test tube validation to do the cellular validation and really the other key part, which is work with people that are working with mice or zebrafish, some other animal model, then that recapitulates what we can do in a test tube. And after all that, obviously, working with the informaticians, it can then go to the human level. So it's obviously very cross-collaborative. Dr. Prasanna, it sounds like um, quite a long process. But when I think of drug repurposing, I think that we're cutting time and we're cutting costs. Um, is it, are we really saving time or is it, is it not? Oh, no, no. We, we, I, I definitely think we're saving time, okay? And like I said, you can cut out the downstream person like me if you just want to do a repurpose drugs in the immediate future, okay? But let's say after a few months, you find out that there were a lot of off topics, you know, uh, effects. Maybe you, you, you have, for example, if you, if you put in a fake DNA to, you know, you know, trick the virus into, you know, putting in the wrong DNA, you're also tricking your own human body. So it's not gonna be good for us either at some level. So um, the simple answer is no, we're definitely saving time. And depending on how severe the disease is, let's say it's a pandemic and we need something really rapidly maybe in a very specific group, maybe in a very focused group, maybe the elderly, maybe the people with pre-existing conditions, maybe there, there should be a little bit more uh, freedom to be allowed you know, certain repurposed drugs earlier, but I'm not a policymaker, it's just a suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Pisano. Uh, I now move on to the Chief Information Officer at the WHO, Mr. Bernardo Mariano. Uh, Mr. Bernardo, we heard from Dr. Rekvendra about how the WHO can better equip data scientists to play their part in healthcare emergencies. What's your response to that? Uh, indeed, uh, the WHO, let me maybe start by uh, saying that uh, we have a, a number of uh, departments in HQ, right? Uh, one, one, two of them are very relevant for on, on, on data, for, especially to support countries and, and data scientists. One of them is the Department of Health Emergence Information and Risk Assessment, and the other one is Department of Data or Division of Data and Anal Analytics. And this this focus on data is a, is a, it comes in the latest restructure of WHO. So in, initially we we had this scattered around, but now we have we have a strong focus on it. But also at the country level, I mean we are present in 150 countries uh, where we work with uh, national uh, entities uh, to 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 really um, address the risk of uh, the, the issue the issues on, on risks, well health risk, but also to, 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 to see how we can leverage uh, on data, to uh, health data, to address uh, some of these emergency risks. But let me talk about two perspectives. One is the global perspective, because when you talk about WHO, we are a global organization. And, 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 and if you wanted to leverage on WHO, is to leverage on that, the fact that we are global. Okay, with the 194 member states, we are, are, are an organization that can perhaps uh, uh, bring, we have that, that convening power, but also we get that, that we allow us through the number of rules, regulations uh, that, that we pass through our member states to really bring collaboration, solidarity. And I have to say that we are not doing very well in this pandemic on the collaboration and solidarity front. Uh, and, 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 but we, and this is something that uh, the Director General of, of WHO, Dr. Tedros, insists solidarity is key to be able to, to better manage and really minimize the, the impact, especially uh, on, on loss of life impact of this pandemic. Now, from the global perspective and use our global role, uh, one of the, the gaps in the uh, healthcare, in health sector, is is the health data, or, or global regulation of health data, uh, as well as as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as, a, as, a, as a, go a good governance framework that allow data scientists to really uh, leverage on the data to 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 to. to uh, better respond to, to diseases, uh, including the pandemic. Of course, we have to also to recognize that uh, 
the tech industry uses data to monetize it, basically monetize on the data. The healthcare sector has a culture of, uh, of donation, not monetization. We don't donate, we donate blood, we donate organs uh, in, the, in, health, in health and life science. In the tech industry where data is key, the data is monetized. So to bring this, this, these two worlds together and really ensure that the, we uh, as, a, as a leverage on, on the data to, for global good and the positive healthy impact, uh, from WHO perspective, we are working in, in, in one, one of the fronts is to, to, to that, that we brought uh, to, to thanks to our member states, we are, we are putting together a global strategy on digital health where, where one of the elements is a health data regulatory framework. Because if you wanted to leverage and use AI for, for health, you need that global uh, data or you need that you need to break those silos in, that the healthcare, healthcare sector is traditionally have, very either a vertical disease, but also we use the same silos to create vertical data sets. And, and that, that's where we, at WHO, we, 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 are, we are working with the member states to bring about uh, some sort of a health data regulatory framework in our global strategy in digital health. The other is, of course, is knowledge and, and, and digital literacy. In, because it's 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 well and 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 good to say that the, the developed countries have uh, uh, the ability to leverage on data, have data scientists, but the disease does not have borders. So so we created recently a WHO Academy to really bring knowledge and digital literacy across. Because because also remember one thing: only for 53 percent of the world. Is, is covered by broadband, has access to internet and, and broadband. Therefore, whatever we say about data uh, and data science and digital, we, want the, we should not forget the fact that almost half of the, the world still don't have access to broadband. Therefore, there are some of these technologies that are data hungry, that rely on data, it, it does not reach those those those, those groups. So so from the so, the so therefore from our perspective, we work. We have this global role to try to bring uh, uh, practices that allow um, uh, countries to to have a better appropriate use of data. Agree on concepts such as health health data for for public goods or, or principles of equitable data sharing for research, for instance but also consistent metadata and definitions for artificial intelligence, data analytics, primary or secondary use of, of data. Of course, we have to also understand that we need to protect, that we need to, to create, to have sure that, make sure that we have privacy, we have confidentiality of the data to ensure that we bring trust to the whole ecosystem. So, so, so as you can see that in addition to, to, the, to supporting uh, data scientists, uh, in, in to, to perform their everyday work, we need to bring also those policies and to ensure that the whole ecosystem is a trusted ecosystem to, to us to be able to ripe all the benefits of data and digital technologies. Not to put you on the spot, Mr. Bernardo, but does this mean uh, you would be willing to donate some of your uh, health data to governmental organizations from your uh, member states, such as uh, Qatar, for instance? Indeed, uh, we at WHO, we are custodians of uh, data from the member states. So the question is actually the other way around. Would, 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 would you be, be willing to share your data with WHO for a global good? Would you be willing to, to share the data to ensure that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, an AI-supported device is able to mine on this global data uh, to, to actually deliver better results and learn more and more for, through machine learning algorithms? So it's the other way around. And we are ready and we are working with the member states to, to, to and we are right there to play that role, exact role Thank you. Um, does uh, Professor Aziz Sheikh want to say something? Yes. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, Dr. Bernardo. I just wanted to um, ask if WHO is a position or any thoughts around more federated approaches to data analysis. And the reason why I ask is because um, 
I mean, as you'll know, in, in many health systems, in the governance frameworks are such that um, actually putting data into a central repository, be that WHO or elsewhere, is incredibly challenging. Um, um, there will be frameworks that uh, prohibit that, but I think there may well be potential to actually try and achieve the same ends by uh, enabling more federated analysis, so um, code centrally written, analysis done within country or health system, and then results being brought out and aggregated perhaps at a digit, I mean, through WHO at a, a global level. Your thoughts on that would be, uh, I'd be interested. Thanks. Indeed, at WHO, we, we are open to any, any, any solution that allow us to bring that global uh, benefit to the global um, ecosystem, to the global uh, community. And, and the, I believe that uh, we wouldn't require some sort of a hybrid solution. Because um, when, when you talk about federated uh, uh, um, let's say aggregation of data, you're basically you are describing a government or a country that has an infrastructure that would that would allow uh, WHO to tap in to query to get I mean to basically uh, 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 access and uh, de uh, basically an anonymized data to for to, to to process to share or to, to share with the global world for global good, but the, we have also countries that do not have health infrastructure that will uh, uh, that would that will allow them to us to do that. So it's a really hybrid situation, and we we we're working with uh, with countries within that perspective. I mean, if you look at the uh, the, the dashboard on, on COVID nineteen, that's that's not something that started with COVID nineteen. It's the the data that we aggregated from countries uh, on disease surveillance. It's 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 part of, of an international health regulation. So so we need to strengthen that. We need to bring technology to that. We need to bring the, some sort of interoperability around it. We need to bring these issues on, on how we can, in a federated way, allow aggregation, uh, uh, collection, but use of data for global good. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bernardo, uh, you've touched a lot on the importance of health data on times of emergency, such as this global pandemic. Um, my next question is around um, data security. So the coronavirus pandemic has undoubtedly taken a heavy toll on human life and livelihood. And in order to flatten this curve, the governments have uh, several governments around the world have resorted to enforcing strict restrictions on movement and have placed a large emphasis on health tracking through contact uh, tracing and apps that rely on self-reporting health information. Has data protection and privacy been jeopardized in the tug of war between pandemic control and personal freedom? We we based based on our, our basically not a strong evidence, but uh, some observations on the last uh, since since January since since the, the, the pandemic was declared, we saw uh, first uh, first of all in the special initial months um, a very strong uh, reaction uh, on, on between, of countries to try to use contact tracing, and then, of course. Uh, in, in that put, puts a number of countries at odds with the, 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 the data privacy rules. I mean, talking about the GDPR or in Europe, where uh, the, where the, 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 the contact tracing had to 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 be implemented in such a way that did not violate the the the, the data protection principles that the European Union established for for the for the whole European region. So what we've seen is that in the initial stage, especially as as tech, tech companies and health sector and government were trying to innovate in this space, there were some concerns about uh, about the potential uh, 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 risk of, uh, of of bridging that privacy. But with time, we've seen that uh, one some I mean this was pushed back. So those solutions were pushed back. But uh, but it's, uh, the, the 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 need to 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 the and the attention to 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 that was key. So. To respond to that, at WHO, we released um, a guidance. It's not a guideline, because guideline takes a lot, a lot of time to develop. We need them a lot more evidence. But the guidance on, on, on the use of contact tracing, 
uh, technology. So, so, so that document covers ethical principles, technical considerations, uh, uh, which, is con which are consistent on how we can achieve equitable and appropriate use of technologies and, 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 and data to ensure that the privacy rules and ethical rules, uh, ethical considerations are not broken. So, I would say, I would say majority of the countries um, uh, we did we did we did, we did witness did, did we did see that uh, that uh, that uh, that they could man, they managed to maintain their privacy. Uh, of course, we have countries that have a strong trust on uh, basically public trust on the ecosystem, uh, uh, where then the contact tracing, uh, to, which was and part of an of a, an integral response of the public health response, not just a, a contact tracing in isolation, because in those in cases where the contact tracing was an isolated entity, the, we have seen that it didn't it did not it, it, it basically failed to deliver the those 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 uh, health outcomes it, it, it was intended. But in countries where contact tracing was part of the public health response, I mean I can say cite South Korea in, in uh, for as, as, as an example, we've seen great advantages of of, of using the, te the technology to really address uh, uh, the, the 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 public health response and manage the, the pandemic. So so we our guidance was to ensure that special countries that did not have uh, uh, data privacy or rules, and we will talk about least and, mid and middle, middle income countries, where, where there was no strong data protection principles. We want to ensure that with the guidance that, that the, as they innovate in this area, where they do not actually penalize the, uh, pr the protection, the privacy of their own citizens. So, 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 so to say that uh, that uh, I think at least from the initial observation, we have we have we have we have, we have, we have, we have a positive indication that the countries did uh, look at the guidance, the best practices, uh, though we had observed initially that was not the case. But uh, but I think now I think they 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 did catch up with the, with that with the, the need to preserve the privacy and ethical consideration of their citizens as as those technologies are rolled out. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bernardo, and thank you all for your very interesting insights on this important topic. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, but we do want to take a few questions um, from that have been uh, submitted in Zoom and on social media. So if that's okay with the panelists, um, if we stay on for a few more minutes, I think we'll take a couple of questions and then um, the rest of the questions we can uh, email to you and perhaps circulate the answers uh, to, uh, to the participants at a later stage. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Um, for one of the questions that came through Zoom from Hamad Arsal Taimur. Uh, in terms of vaccination trials, how has computational biology allowed scientists to develop a vaccine for COVID, i.e. virus model, genome mapping, et cetera? How has the virus made it difficult for scientists? Maybe Dr. Prasanna, Dr. Raghavendra, Professor Aziz Sheikh, whoever would like to take the question. I mean, I'm not really a computational uh, person, but it's talking computational. I'm not aware of that many good computational approaches for something like vaccine research, but this is not my area. Maybe Dr. Uh, Professor Aziz or Raghavendra has their own opinion, which are more informed. But something like vaccine, you really need to have the actual real virus or virus determinants, whether it be RNA, DNA, and have something that's real injected into eggs, animals, whatever, to be able to generate, okay, uh, a specific antibody response. Once that has kind of been elicited, then you can go around kind of passing this vaccine. That's as far as I know. I'm sure there may be some computational ap approaches that could help it. But I think vaccines, from what I know, it seems like it's extremely empirical driven, but I'm sure the uh, computational people might yeah, so I mean, I just can add to that answer a little bit. So there has been some research on like generation of antibodies and like uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that can be used for uh, neutralization of uh, viruses and you can use computational techniques for that. So yes, there are some, uh, you can identify whether a, 
new antibody can basically neutralize a particular viral strain or not. So there are techniques um, like machine learning methods which have come out for that. But in terms of vaccination, I am not very sure like whether there are some uh, like uh, proper computational models or how computational models are helping out in this aspect. So that's what I would say. In terms of antibodies, for sure, there is like NetMXC span. There are some different methods which I can redirect also to. Okay, uh, maybe we'll move on to a, a second question then. Um, this question is from Abdullah al Mohannadi. Do you think such public health crisis uh, accelerates the use? I can't see it anymore. I can't see it anymore on my screen. <laughs> Yeah, so Maha, I can take that if you want. You can see it, yes, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, I think um, uh, absolutely. Um, and the reasons are mainly because, um, you know, the volume of data being generated and the willingness, I think, of investigators to find ways of um, sharing data. And, and what I think it's, this crisis has done is, is it's also accelerated um, people coming together from um, a variety of disciplinary backgrounds. So I think overall this has been sort of catalytic. Um, and my, my hope is that uh, this won't be a sort of a, a flash in the pan. It won't be a, just a temporary phenomena. But what we can do is actually harness, uh, I mean, there's still a long way to go. Um, as we were hearing from Dr. Barnardo, uh, uh, but, but that said, I mean, I think it has been a step in the right direction uh, from my perspective at least. Thank you. Um, and the last question from Mr. Mark Matthias, Doctor, it's um, for Dr. Mariano. Many countries have nuanced legislation regulating the collection and dissemination of data that would need to be considered in a global data strategy. Do you foresee any unique challenges facing a global data strategy in that data will need to be shared across borders? Yes, indeed. Uh, we, we, I mean, remember one thing, the WHO is composed by 194 member states. So the global strategy in digital health, we need needs to be approved by those member states. And there, as, therefore, the, the, it has to be somehow uh, either aligned or, or, or allow those countries to be able to, to, to implement uh, what they approve. But the, if you ask the question about telemedicine, for instance, pre-pandemic, so the challenge of telemedicine is not technology, it's policies. And today, uh, because of the COVID-19, many countries realize that uh, telemedicine needs, we need to change the regulations to allow telemedicines to, to basically to evolve, mature, and, and, and be widely implemented. So similarly, on the data side, pre, pre, prior to the pandemic, I think we, the, the challenges were, would be much, much higher compared to now, because now countries realize it's needed, it's required, and without it, the next pandemic we will do we will do worse or equal to this pandemic. So, so, so the, with that, I, I, yes, there are challenges uh, there on, on, on data sharing. Uh, there's uh, there's challenges on 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 having health data moving across borders, and those challenges we've been discussing with a number of mem member states. And, and there were two pieces in the global strategy that, that addresses that. And, and for all the viewers that want to look at the draft the global strategy, which is, which is in the internet, just Google global strategy on digital health, you will find the draft. Uh, these, these, there's, there's already a better draft to, to, to from that, what is published, because it is, it's gonna be approved next, next in, in November to, uh, by, by, the, by, 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 by our member states. But there are two pieces there that I wanted to call attention to all of you. One, is this uh, develop a regulatory framework on international health data. So that's in the global strategy. The other one is develop a framework for regulating benchmark and certifying artificial intelligence uh, uh, and digital health and medical devices. So, so there are a number of uh, frameworks that we want to, that is, uh, are in the strategy that we we'll need to develop. And I think there was one question, how we can, uh, how, 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 uh, we, how we can work with WHO. So, to develop those frameworks, we need both the experts, the countries. We, I mean, we need all the sector, the, the scientists, the, the academia, to really make sure that those frameworks they deliver on the promise. So, so we we also creating what we call a network of networks, a multi-stakeholder approach, because 
to, until now, governments meet alone, private sector meets alone, or, or academia meets alone. So we need to bring together those sectors to use the power, the brain power that, the, that is in this multi-sectoral approach to really bring the best uh, out of everyone to, to make sure that next time we do better. Thank you, Mr. Bernardo. I'll take one question uh, from, the, from the ones that we received from social media just so that I'm not ignoring that part. Um, there's been talk of drug companies pledging not to profit from the COVID drugs they're developing. Should there be a similar pledge by drug companies if their existing drugs are used to fight COVID? Is, is that, that could, I mean, if, if from my perspective, I have to say that due to, during the pandemic, we have seen uh, an unprecedented support and collaboration from the private sector, um, uh, which, which I, we are very grateful to. And we want to continue to see, to see that. Of course, there's always a conflict between, between uh, uh, the profitability of a company and, and, the, and the, the need to perhaps uh, provide a, a, a global goods that will, will benefit everyone. But I think what pandemic is teaching us is that there's no such a thing as a virus that doesn't affect even the profitability of a company. So we want to see the, the, the private sector to step up and they, they have done a lot, but let's not uh, drop the ball because the pandemic is still there. So, so as, 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 as a staff from WHO, we want to see every entity, both private sector, pharmaceutical, working together to, to, to ensure that the world is safe, to ensure that we do better health-wise, but also to ensure that those companies they have a better profit with a healthy workforce. So we need to work together. We need that solidarity and we need that collaboration. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time and I really wanted to thank our speakers and thank our audience for joining our webinar. We hope that you'll also join us for WISH's upcoming uh, Global Health Conference taking place this year from November 15th to the 19th where we'll be exploring a wide range of pressing global health challenges over five days. And I encourage you all to check out wish.org.qa for more details on how to apply um, to attend this virtual event. Um, thank you again, uh, everyone, and have a great night.